Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Walter Isaacson. And after 14 years, it's my very distinct pleasure to welcome you all back to the Aspen Ideas Festival. This is a little bittersweet for me. This is my last summer as CEO of the Institute, assuming they actually pick a successor. If they don't, maybe I'll stick around another four or five years. But um, it made me think about all the things I relish about this place. And one of them is this moment where we have a group of uh, people here. There's sort of the excitement and we're all gonna find out some new ideas. And to me, the key of this, as I've discovered over the years we've been doing it, is a very simple concept, which is that of curiosity. Kitty Boone has been our curiosity curator this whole time, and I wanted to write a book on curiosity, because every time I come here, I think more about the value of just pure, simple curiosity for its own sake, about ideas, about subjects you don't know about, about how they all tie together, and how that helps us understand what we're doing in this world. You know, every person I've written about, I've discovered their secret was a passionate and playful curiosity. You know, from Benjamin Franklin, Einstein, Steve Jobs, writing about Leonardo da Vinci, now they're all smart, but as you know from being here, smart people are a dime a dozen. They don't usually amount to much. <laughs> but it's the creative people, the people with a playful curiosity that tend to be the ones that innovate and change our world. When I remember Benjamin Franklin, his curiosity was very practical and applied. He believed that the reason you should have curiosity is because then you'd be able to turn it into things that were useful. When he did his electricity experiments, which were actually the most important scientific experiments of that era, drawing lightning from the clouds and doing uh, all the static electricity, at one point he lamented, what use are these discoveries, what use is this uh, ideas about electricity, because we've not found an application for them. At one point, at the end of the first summer of experiments, he created what he called a battery, what we still call a battery, where he stored the electricity. They used it to kill the turkeys for the end of season feast. And he wrote that the turkeys were uncommonly tender. So we Southerners like to think that among his many inventions was the first fried turkey. <laughs> but he also said, you know, it's like Newton's theory of gravity, he said, is no use because we know if you drop the plate, it'll fall to the ground. We have to put things to use. He eventually does with the lightning rod and so many other things. He figures out how whirlwinds work and then has all of his postal agents up and down the coast follow the storms. So he figures out that northeastern storms, the path that they follow. Now, that's all very cool. But after a while, I began to realize that curiosity has an importance that goes beyond applied curiosity. And it was partly because of Einstein I got that. Einstein, when he was a little kid, got a compass, and the needle twitched and pointed north, and he was mesmerized by this. And he, walked, he couldn't figure out, because nothing physical was touching the particles of the needle, but it kept moving and twitching and pointing north. And uh, you know, you and I remember getting compasses, right? And then we say, oh, wow, it points north, and a few minutes later, it was like, oh, a dead squirrel, and we're on to something else. His whole life, until his deathbed, he's still trying to figure out a unified field theory that ties together uh, gravity and particles and waves, electromagnetic waves. And so people would ask me, after I wrote a book on him, well, why was it so important? I mean, I know his great theories, he understands how the universe, how was that applied? How does that affect our lives? It was the most common question I got. And I came up with a variety of answers, which is basically, you know, you need general relativity to have GPS in your car work. And if you understand surface states of semiconducting materials, how quantum mechanics works, you can 
turn into an on-off switch and create microchips. So all of these things were applied to a science. Einstein didn't care about that. If I showed him an iPhone and said it has GPS and a microchip in it, you know, he cared about why the needle twitched and pointed north, why the sky was blue, why waves traveled at a constant speed, simply because he felt it was important to be curious about our universe for its own sake. So when I picked up doing Leonardo da Vinci, which I'm uh, coming out this fall, I looked at his applied curiosity, because he was the most curious man in history. He had a more passion and playful curiosity than anybody in history. Kitty Boone gave me a book once of the lists he made. And if you look at the lists, it was every day what he was curious about. One of them was, describe the tongue of the woodpecker. I mean, you got to be somebody who's really, <laughs> I mean, how would you even know? I mean, how'd you find out? But he did. And it wasn't because he needed to paint a bird or do a flying machine or whatever. Over and over again, describe the placenta of the calf, figure out how they make locks work in Milan. All of these things are in his notebook. And yes, they were applied. He dissected human cadavers so he could find every muscle and nerve on the face and how they move different parts of the lips. And then he used that to paint the most amazing, memorable smile in history. But then he kept dissecting and going deeper, all the way down, 30, 40 cadavers, to find every nerve and every muscle in the bottle, body. Not because he needed it to paint any painting, not because there was any application, but just as Vitruvian man is a symbol of it, because he wanted to know how we fit into this world and into this cosmos. And so the really cool thing about Aspen Ideas Festival is we can, when we get interviewed by the papers or by our trustees or whoever it is, say, here's an idea that was brought into action. We like moving ideas into action. And here's the Franklin Project and other things. But the really wonderful thing about the Aspen Ideas Festival is when it leads to curiosity just for its own sake. Just because if you're curious about a whole lot of things, it not only enriches your life, but it enriches the people around you, helps you understand how you fit into your community and how we fit into this world and how our world fits into this cosmos. The very end uh, of Leonardo, he had answered all the questions, and I thought I'd give you one of his answers, which was that the tongue of the woodpecker is actually three times longer than the bill of the woodpecker. It wraps around the brain, unlike anything else in living species. And so when the woodpecker hits the bark, it sort of cushions the brain. There is no reason you need to know that. <laughs> it's not useful at all. Nor was it useful to Leonardo. But I thought maybe you, just like Leonardo, just out of pure curiosity, would want to know. And now is my pleasure to introduce my partner in curiosity and intellectual inspiration, one of the true giants who walked this earth, David Bradley. <laughs> Jeff Goldberg suggested he also introduced me as the first American Pope. <laughs> so dear friends of, of so many years, it feels like it's been so long. Um, and for those of you who are new to the Ideas Festival, welcome. I'm David Bradley. I'm the owner of The Atlantic, and I want to welcome you as well. In most years, it falls to me to do uh, the administrative announcements, so if you would bear with me a few moments. Um, <clears throat> First, our program director, Kitty Boone, wants you to know that she and her staff have gone to some length to make sure that there is no partisan feel or drift to this year's <laughs> festival. So you should be able to go through the whole thing without any kind of sense of contention. Um, I think I've got this wrong. That's not humor. Um, I've got humor. <laughs> Uh, anyway, with that in mind, that no contention in mind, um, coming from Washington, I wanted to tell you uh, the only, the single topic in which 100% of Republicans and Democrats agree, where there is no 
no partisan division at all, is the subject of Ted Cruz. <laughs> So let me, let me ask you a question. Why is the Trump administration so excited about the prospect of appointing Ted Cruz to the Supreme Court? Eight new vacancies. <laughs> this second announcement, I think, is, is more significant. And it comes from uh, the Board of Trustees of the Institute. As background, I think many of you know that these big tent festivals, like the Aspen Ideas Festival or the Sun Valley Writers Conference, can be fragile economic affairs. And every once in a while, one of them hits hard times and either goes under or needs to find <clears throat> a more secure organization uh, to absorb it. Um, that happened this spring. One of the largest and most storied of the big tent uh, festivals came to the board here and proposed a merger, and in the end, we decided to go ahead with it. Um, so it's my privilege to be the one to announce it. I want to announce that the uh, Aspen Ideas Festival has acquired Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus. <laughs> that is the good news. The bad news is that, like any merger, we are having trouble integrating the two cultures. We had wanted to preview for you some new shared programming that we're going to be doing. Oh my, the problems. Um, let me just talk you through a few of them. Our plan was to begin this, this year's festival with a parade of our speakers through town, <laughs> led by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, riding Jumbo the Elephant. <laughs> Unfortunately, the trainer of Jumbo, Rex Tillerson, hasn't been seen or heard of since January. So as we speak, Justice Ginsburg and Jumbo are wandering up Route 82 towards the Resnick property. <laughs> At the very top of the music tent, we wanted to present a pair of death-defying trapeze artists, Elizabeth Warren and Newt Gingrich. <laughs> In some ways, this is an irresistible act, but Elizabeth keeps dropping Newt. <laughs> and she's getting defensive about it, saying, she's ready, she's ready to go without a net. Also at the top of the tent, also at the top of the tent, we intended to feature the daring tightrope work of the New York Times editorial board. <laughs> but so far, David Brooks, Tom Friedman, Maureen Dowd just keep standing there clinging to the platform. <laughs> Every once in a while, they drop down a well-reasoned 750-word column on the Trump administration, but we just have this sense the act isn't working. Turning to more serious content, we have an hour discussion titled Climate Change and the Warming of the Seas, moderated by Andrea Mitchell, with a panel of three trained seals. <laughs> We've been having trouble developing a debate here. The seals keep insisting the water feels just fine, and they're asking Andrea for a fish. <laughs> and then as to one of our most sensational acts, the firing of the human cannonball We've gotten a little bogged down with a panel of Harvard faculty debating what it actually means to be truly human. Meanwhile, Secretary Clinton keeps trying to load James Comey into the cannon, <laughs> even though it's not her act. <laughs> and then there's the biggest announcement of all. Walter Isaacson's March 14th announcement that he will, at the end of the year, be departing the Aspen Institute and the Ideas Festival in favor of his childhood home. The prospect of Walter's departure hit me harder than I would have expected. For a dozen years, a little more than that, since our inaugural year, I have shared this podium welcoming you to the Ideas Festival. But when I say shared this podium, I understand that actually the creation of the Aspen Ideas Festival is singly the accomplishment of Walter Isaacson. This podium is Walter Isaacson's podium. Not literally this podium. Um, Walter's personal podium is in his bedroom where <laughs> every night as Kathy's dozing off, he tries to just share a few more ideas with her. <laughs> but you understand what I mean when I say this podium is Walter's. I must have thought this would last forever, and nothing does. So if you will bear with me, I wanted to take my time and use it to give a tribute to Walter Isaacson. 
And I thought that one way uh, to, for all of us to honor Walter is figuratively to be by his side as he journeys back to New Orleans. So just for a few moments, I want to take you back to 1960s New Orleans and the, uh, the world of Walter's youth. I spent some time this month tracking down and then interviewing some of the most important figures in Walter's childhood. Walter makes this easy. He attended the same private day school from kindergarten to 12th grade, the uh, Isidore Newman School at 1903 Jefferson Avenue. And largely, Walter kept the same group of friends. So I found five friends from the inner circle, and then remarkably, two teachers who taught Walter 50 years ago, and then, of course, Walter's younger brother, Lee. Given, <laughs> given everyone's loyalty, loyalty to you, Walter, um, I would have expected that there would be stories um, that no one would share with a stranger, especially someone from media. Um, and I can't tell you how generous and, what is the word here, uninhibited, <laughs> I found your friends. So I've had to use my own discretion. With my apology to all of you, what I'm going to do is purge any of the embarrassments um, that all these years later um, could just trouble Walter to, to have everyone know. Um, <clears throat> so for example, uh, <laughs> when Walter's friends chatting with me began to relax, um, and they began to refer to him by his schoolyard name, which was Froggy, I said to myself, would his friends in New York and Washington, would he want those friends to, to know this name? And I decided, no, he wouldn't want them. <laughs> so I am decided I'm not going to mention the name Froggy in these remarks. And finally, as preamble, I recognize that all of you are here for an ideas festival. You are here for matters of the mind and not the flesh. But I don't know how you tell the coming of age of Walter Isaacson without at least trying to find the first kiss. <laughs> but a problem set in immediately. Whoever she was, she didn't attend the Isidore Newman School. So in many hours of conversation with Walter's friends, what would surprise you? Well, not his popularity. By everyone's account, Walter was the most popular kid in school. He was probably the most popular kid in the whole of the school, not just his class. He was cheerful, fun, funny, engaging, social, charming. But he was as well, in the words of his best friend, Stephanie, a miscreant. Walter, she said, broke all the rules. Walter was best known for something called fenorking. Walter's friend Rob explained this to me. On weekend nights, Walter would organize a caravan of six to eight cars to creep around the backside of Audubon Zoo, lights out, pitch black. They would inch up to the fence that surrounds the lake, the shallow lake, where the flamingos slept, standing on one leg. And then on signal, they'd all throw on the headlights, honk the horn, throwing half the birds into cardiac arrest. <laughs> and sending the rest of them struggling for flight with this noise, apparently, fenork, fenork, fenork. <laughs> As an aside, nobody knows the origin of Walter's pathological antipathy to flamingos. <laughs> His editors talk about this, that he tries to sneak it into the book proposal titles. Uh, Einstein in his relatively dumb flamingo. <laughs> the wise men, smarter than flamingos. Walter has a high school friend named Tom, <clears throat> who said among his best memories are going egging, even when they both got caught. I said to Tom, who gets caught egging? Tom, we kept egging the same man's house. <clears throat> <clears throat> David, why? Tom, he shot my dog. <laughs> with Tom, as with others, I pressed uh, on Walter's first kiss. And what was funny was everyone had the same best guess at who gave him that first chaste kiss. It was Estelle, a great beauty Estelle, but not a student at Newman, and now 50 years later, completely disappeared. Walter's ninth grade English teacher, Dave Prescott, I caught him just a few days before his retirement after 51 years teaching at the Newman School. Remarkably, Walter was in the first class Mr. Prescott ever taught. He explained that Walter was in the class of 1970, 
That is Newman's equivalent of the West Point class of 1915, famously called the class the fall star, the, the class the stars fell on, known for uh, creating the four-star generals of World War II. I heard this often, Newman's class of 1970 was the most impressive class that has gone through the school to this day. And within that class, the most memorable was Walter Isaacson. Mr. Prescott argued that Walter just owned high school. He was president of his class. He was president of the student body. He was on the school's champion quiz bowl team. He was on the school's debate team. He was on stage for Tom Jones. He was the winner of the Ford Future Scientist of America Award. And he was the winner of the Mechanical Drawing Award. Which makes me think, really, Walter? Was that necessary? <laughs> Some poor kid, his only thing he could do was mechanical drawing. <laughs> Mr. Prescott, Prescott referenced admiringly that Walter had created the first computer dance at the school. But Stephanie gave me the backstory. It is true he created the first computer dance for the school. Uh, all the students fig, uh, filled out long questionnaires with personal and dating preferences, and then the whole was fed into a computer so the computer could kick out um, matching people for, uh, for the dance. Save, as Stephanie explained, it turns out there was no computer. Walter was the computer. <laughs> he read through these highly personal forms and made his own matches. So back at Newman in 1979, there was no computer for the computer dance. In related news today, Walter never actually met Steve Jobs. <laughs> By now, I had put out the word about Estelle and that first kiss, and still she remained elusive. As the interviews progressed, I became mindful of what wasn't being said. Like Arthur Conan Doyle's story of the dog that didn't bark, I was struck by what was missing. The word smart. Wouldn't that be the least of what you would say? Smart, intelligent, highly intelligent, brilliant. None of this came up. So I began to lead the witness. I said, was Walter the smartest kid in the class? And everyone jumped in and said, no. <laughs> but the larger problem was they went on and named different people. Alex Godshaw, Diane Katz, David Derbys, and so forth. As far as I could tell, there was no one at the Newman School not smarter than Walter Isaacson. <laughs> Mr. Prescott clearly admired Walter, but smartest? No, he said. That would be Alex Godshaw. Then happily, helpfully, he added, Walter was talkative. <laughs> Running a little deeper, no one at the Newman School seemed to have spotted the scale of Walter's talent and ambition. No one had seen in our parlance that they had, in that midst, a young man in a hurry. So if not raw intelligence, what did the faculty and student reference, students reference? Walter, I hope what follows pleases you. What your friends and faculty spoke to first is what an earlier generation called a kindly spirit. Even if he would not claim it as his own, Walter knows of what I speak. Walter's father, Irwin, was known in New Orleans as a kindly gentleman. Delivering the Jefferson Lecture for the National Endowment for the Humanities, Walter called his father a kindly, Jewish, distracted humanist. And then when his dad passed this January, he eulogized him as the kindest man I ever knew. Here I did not lead the witness. Your friends explained, and here I'm quoting them, that you were the first one kind of the transfer student, the one with no critical word for a classmate, the last one to cut you off at the knees, the regular guy with the occasional flashes of extra thoughtfulness. These friends of 60 years standing, and who has friends of 60 years standing, still turn to you as the person they go to in a dark hour. So it would be natural that your brother would turn to you but you can't begin to understand how grateful he is that you were with him when his marriage failed. And Stephanie wanted to be married too badly. And she went to you and asked if she could stand beside you, if you would stand beside her for her marriage. And instead, what you said is, I think you were marrying the wrong person. And she insisted on going ahead, and you stood beside her. And then you stood beside her again when her marriage fell. 
In the words of the Old Testament, the sins of the father pass to the sons unto the fourth generation. In this, in the eyes of your friends, you are your father's son. So almost by way of code, I want to tell you about the last two friends. Mr. McKenzie, the history teacher, now 83 years old, long retired after 38 years of teaching at the Newman School. Mr. McKenzie could be forgiven if there were days when he questioned his life's calling. Picture the 33-year-old Mr. McKenzie, who should at that moment be in the vertical ramp of his life, and instead he's stuck at the front of a classroom, saying for the 10th time that morning, or the 40th time that week, or the 4,000th time in his young career of teaching, that he wanted the students to pay attention to whatever the material was at hand. Like the rest of us, maybe he had existential fears. Is this it? Is this all there is for me? Is there no more meaning than a classroom of 20 teens all interested only in each other? But what if in that storied class of 1970, Mr. McKenzie could have known that he was teaching history to the man who would become the greatest popular historian of our time? Then Mr. McKenzie might be teaching in batches of 20, but therein was the man to teach history to the millions. Did Mr. McKenzie know this? Well, in that school of 750 students, 60 faculty and staff, he alone might have been the one to know that they had there a talent of a lifetime. He said to me, was he the smartest talent? Yes. He was the best student in my 38 years, the best writer in my career. He then added a bit gratuitously that Walter was better than the other famous student he had named Michael Lewis. <laughs> <clears throat> Give him my love, he said, as he ended the conversation. And then speaking of love, whatever happened to the elusive Estelle? <laughs> well, it would not be for want of trying that we failed to find her. Every friend joined in the search, going online, sending out emails, tracking down leads. Even Mr. Prescott gave ideas. I think it's fair to say that this was the largest manhunt in a southern state <laughs> since South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford went hiking the Appalachian Mountains. <laughs> and in the end, it was Rob who found Estelle. Traveling by car, you would exit New Orleans to the west, heading 133 miles out Route 90. You'd come to a small town, New Iberia, population of 30,000. It's a town of uneven fortunes, but with a prosperous elite occupying the historic Victorian mansions there. And there in New Iberia, you will find Estelle. There would be a dime store novel's appeal if I could say she sat there alone, no fortune, impoverished, sustained only by the memories of what might have been. <laughs> but she was a fun, happy, spirited woman in a very happy marriage, married to a highly successful businessman. But that does not mean that she has forgotten Walter. I'll let her words tell the story. What drew me to him? Well, I can tell you why we hit it off. It was his Pontiac. <laughs> A late model Le Mans. We met at age 15. I was two days older, but I guess he had the Pontiac. Back then, my mom was into politics. I was the opposite. Let me paint my nails. I was a people person, a sorority girl. I used to tell him, you would be the last person I'd marry. You'd just sit around reading Time magazine. <laughs> I'd be so bored. Walter was goofy. No, that's not the word. He was silly. I didn't see his exceptional talent. What I saw was that he was magnanimous. He never said a bad thing about any of his friends. Junior year, my dad left the family. None of my friends said a word. Walter said, I hear your parents split up. I'm really sorry. You must be having a rough time. It meant so much to me. I got to the question. I asked Estelle about the first kiss. And I suppose this will be the hardest moment for Walter. <laughs> she 
she didn't remember. <laughs> but later, the Pontiac jogged her memory. So this is Estelle again. That's right, over at the Frost Hop, you know the root beer diner with a big mug over it. They have a parking lot. It wasn't romantic, I was teaching him. <laughs> then Estelle referenced the lifelong learner, the avid student of Kissinger and Einstein and Da Vinci that we've become to know, we've come to know as Walter. I was teaching him, she said, but he definitely wanted to learn. There was no longing or regret in Estelle as she talked to Walter, but she remembers. She told me that she keeps a photo album, and in it is a photograph of the two of them, age 18, headed off to the prom. From time to time, someone will be paging through the album and will say, who's that? That's Walter Isaacson. You mean the guy who writes about Einstein? Yes, she responds. Maybe there's a pause. The memories all are sweet. But like everything in life, eventually the conversation moves on. Walter shared his New Orleans news with me in early March. My reaction over the intervening weeks has surprised me. It's a much deeper and more lingering sadness than I would have expected. It does none of us good for me to detail it. I just wanted you to know it was there. Six years before he died, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to his daughter about the love he still felt for his deceased wife. Memorably, he said of her that that, that was the woman with whom I spent 10 years in uncheckered happiness. Isn't that pure Jefferson? Uncheckered happiness. Nothing in mortal life is uncheckered happiness. But that was the term that kept occurring to me as I was thinking through these remarks. Walter, it has been a once-in-a-lifetime privilege to be your partner. I must have thought this would last forever. Nothing does. Godspeed, Walter Isaacson. Now we kick off the conversation of ideas with my friend Andrew Ross Sorkin and Astro Teller. It is, it is very hard uh, to follow that. We just give you another like 20 minutes on stage. It is also a privilege uh, for me to be here uh, today. I was just thinking as you were speaking, I've been coming here now for more than a decade. Uh, and David, you've done remarkable things here. Uh, but uh, Walter, uh, this is a testament to you, uh, really, uh, what you've done to elevate this entire festival. Um, so thank you. Um, it, is, it is also a privilege for me to be here with Astro Teller. Um, for those of you who don't know Astro, if you will indulge me, uh, let me tell you about him. Because to kick something like this off and to think about ideas, this is uh, perhaps the ultimate man uh, of ideas. Uh, he came into this world, I should tell you, with very big shoes to fill uh, because his paternal grandfather was physicist Edward Teller of the hydrogen bomb. His maternal grandfather was Gerald Debro, a Nobel winning economist. So the gene thing kind of worked out for you. <laughs> um, he's known for taking moonshots, a term uh, borrowed from John F. Kennedy's a famous speech where he set the US, of course, uh, on its course to space. And today he is the captain of Moonshots. That's literally his title uh, at X, which is a subsidiary of Alphabet, better known to you all and to me as Google. Uh, he is responsible there for what they describe as transformational change. This is long-term audacious projects that are designed to be 10 times, this is important, 10 times better 
to change the world. His resume is so long, uh, I, I won't get into it. It would, it would take a moonshot uh, to get there. Uh, but just to give you an idea of some of the projects that they're currently working on that are public, many are secret, uh, he is working on something called Project Loon. This is a balloon-powered internet project. Uh, Project Wing, an aerial delivery system using self-flying uh, vehicles. Uh, Makani, a new type of wind turbine that they hope are going to accelerate the, the shift to clean renewable energy through the development of energy kites. And that's not even the stuff that Google and you all know about when it comes to autonomous cars and everything else. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Let, let me start with this, and I want to get into the future and what the future looks like as you see it. But I also want to talk about ideas. Uh, because I imagine you come in contact with lots of ideas. Uh, Walter's been writing about men of ideas for a very long time. What is the difference between somebody with a brilliant idea and a crazy idea? Um, what an awesome question. Uh, you absolutely can't know at the beginning. You can often filter quickly, but if you present to me something which breaks the second law of thermodynamics, I won't get all the way to my desk to tell the first friend that I work with about your idea before I've discarded the idea. But there's still a process by which we say, we ought to say if we care about big ideas, OK, that sounded pretty exciting. How fast, how efficiently can we discover that your idea is wrong? Because almost all of your ideas are wrong. Almost all of my ideas are wrong. And nobody, particularly the people who supposedly are the geniuses who come up with it, know at the beginning. They all think that they're right, so that doesn't tell you anything. You have to go through the process of subjecting every idea to various tests. And the trick is not whether you have to go through that. You have to. It's how efficiently you subject it to the tests and whether you make the people feel good about having brought up the idea in the first place when their chances are 99% of having their idea be discarded. So when you pursue an idea, you, talk, you use this phrase, uh, being irresponsibly responsible. What does that mean? You know, I, it drives the people at X crazy, but I think the reality is that if you're trying to do really big things, uh, and you're trying to do them in a systematic way, you're trying to be efficient about them, I frequently say to people at X, we're not trying to be the gamblers of innovation. We're trying to be the card counters of innovation. There's a difference. So we have to keep in balance this sort of raging optimism that anything is possible, but then not let anything through. We have to have this sort of scathing paranoia that's paired with that. You want everyone to show up at the beginning of the day feeling like Peter Pan, but you, you hired them, they had a PhD when you hired them, and that's not an accident, and you want them to be able to both say something like, we could live forever, let's go to Neverland, and, okay, practically, how is that gonna work? And to get to brass tacks quickly about that. That's the responsibly irresponsible. We have other sayings, but they're meant to capture that same thing, like patiently impatient. What's the best idea that you missed? Meaning, it really was, you thought it was crazy, but in fact, it was brilliant. Oh, there are a lot. <laughs> I tell you, one of the ones where I remember, uh, it wasn't at X, this was before X, but someone showed me an early camera phone, and I just thought, I, I don't really use social media, so maybe I could be forgiven that I, I wasn't wired that way, but they said, look, you can take pictures of like the people around you, and I thought, why, the cameras are better than camera phones. They said, yeah, but then you can send it to your friends. And I said, no one's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I distinctly remember poo-pooing that one. OK. <laughs> one other question just on ideas and people for one second, which is this. <clears throat> do you think that everybody here or elsewhere has one good idea in them? Or do you think the best ideas actually come from the same people repeatedly? No way. Everyone here has hundreds of great ideas. How many people here think that you're wildly creative? <laughs> okay. How many people here believed you were wildly creative when you were six years old? <laughs> we beat it out of each other over time. 
The people in this room do not need to be trained to have big ideas. They have big ideas all the time. You are self-filtering your big ideas because you believe that your peers don't want to hear it. You believe that your manager doesn't want to hear it. You believe that if you try and you fail, you will be punished instead of rewarded, no matter how smart it was to try that big idea that didn't work. These people only need a context. Everyone needs a context in which those big ideas can come out. But people don't need training to create big ideas. They just need the excuse. They just need the context. OK, uh, one more question on people. You could call it the Steve Jobs question, or to, to modernize it, you could call it the Travis Kalanick question. Excuse my French. Um, do you have to be an asshole to have a great idea? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, who here thinks that creativity comes from meanness? <laughs> who here thinks that creative, creativity comes from fear? Creativity comes from love and humor. That is the source of creativity. So when you create an environment of fear, when you create a, an environment that is sort of top-down in micromanagement, that doesn't mean that you can't unlock a lot of value. Steve Jobs was an incredibly creative person. But if you want to unleash everybody in this room, everyone in your organization, to be at their full potential, at least if you have a long-term perspective, it's love and it's humor. OK, let's talk about the future. Um, paint the picture. 10 years out, I wake up in the morning. How is my life different? What does it look like? What does everyone's life in, in this world look like? It's, fundamentally different than it is today. You know, I was, I was flying here. This is partly to answer your question. And I was looking at a little girl who's on the plane who had a tablet in front of her. And I was thinking, just imagine trying to explain 30 years ago to someone you know, where CRTs, cathode ray tubes, was just how you did it. You had like this electron gun, and you could steer it with these plates, and it had to hit this phosphorescent like, thing in front of it. The idea that it would be that small, including the battery, that some little kid would have it on the plane. I think what will surprise us is both how different the world is, and that many of the benefits that we want that the little girl of 30 years ago still wanted to watch something. She just couldn't take it on the plane. And I think in lots of ways, we will experience that our lives aren't different because we're not humans anymore, because we don't crave communication, because we're not trying to learn, because we no longer care to seek out fulfillment and a sense of accomplishment. The tools are just going to be different. That's what's going to be different. But in terms of fundamental change, in terms of what our, our, our true day-to-day -day looks like, Peter Thiel famously said, uh, we wanted flying cars. That's what we all envisioned. Instead, we got 140 characters, right? We, we talk about innovation all the time. Uh, in, but, but how meaningfully is all the stuff that you, that you think you're working on right now going to truly change uh, when I wake up in the morning uh, my day? 10 years from now, it will shock you. So another way, I, and I know what you want is specifics. Like, there will be a lot of self-driving cars around in 10 years. Like, there's a specific. I believe Bloom-powered internet will be boring. It will just be like part of how people get data. Uh, so there are concrete things like that. But I would give you this as a way to think about it. Look at the history of progress and the way that it ramps up. So 10 years from now, we are tempted to think is sort of going to be analogous to 10 years in the past. That if we could imagine ourselves 10 years ago and then look forward 10 years, that's about how weird it will feel 10 years from now. And I think that that is a bad surrogate because things continue to speed up, and there's no evidence they will do anything but continue to speed up. So you probably need to look back 20, maybe as much as 30 years in the past to imagine the same level of discontinuity that you would expect if you woke up tomorrow 10 years from now. I think that that sense of like where the personal computer was just getting serious in the world, and now everyone has multiple ones on their body, that 10 years from now is how we're going to feel. And I know you'd rather that I just give you the concrete, like it'll be embedded in our eyeballs. But, <laughs> but the truth is, innovation doesn't happen by a process of knowing the right answer. It is radical iteration. And so the, what I can t tell you with confidence is the process and the trajectory, but not necessarily the outcome. OK, let's do autonomous cars, and then I want to do flying cars afterwards, because right. that's the next. Uh, moonshot, if you will. 
Autonomous cars 10 years from now, what percentage of the vehicles on the road will be fully autonomous? You'll get in the car, you'll say, I need to get to the Jerome Hotel, and the car will just take you there. Um, I don't know, half. Um, but that'll be, that'll be half. half. But that'll be entirely rate limited by the fact that we have a massive installed base of cars that people have already paid for. And so we are not just, even if self-driving cars worked perfectly tomorrow and there were no regulatory issues, people are not gonna take every car that they have and just throw it away. That's just too much money. So there will be a phasing uh, in of self-driving cars over an extended period of time, and that will be because society is getting used to them, it's because the old cars are being phased out. By the way, self-driving car is not a monolithic thing. You know, what we're working on at Alphabet is like, Charlie's great glass elevator. You just push a button, you say where you want it to go, and it takes you there. Uh, there are other people who are doing things that are more sort of like the car drives a lot of the time, but if things get kind of squirrely, the human takes over. And there will probably, even 10 years from now, be a mix of those things on the road. Okay, you said people are gonna have to get used to it. Let me ask you this question, it's a little more complicated. <clears throat> Today, there are 35,000 uh, fatalities on the road using cars that we all drive. What just in the United States. Just in the United States. What number does that have to go down to where it becomes politically palatable to the public that they may, may very well get in a car and there may be a fatality as a result of a computer? Well, for example, um, we already, almost every single person in this room already made that choice today. Now maybe or in the last couple of days, because you all got on a plane. Planes fly roughly 99% of the miles they fly by computer. It's now to the place where it is not safe for humans to fly in a lot of conditions. It's mandated that the computer fly because the computer can do it better. And there's like a negative feedback cycle here because now people aren't getting enough experience doing the flying, which is actually exacerbating this. But would you, if you could have a robotic surgeon that made one mistake in 10,000 or a human that made right. one mistake in 1,000, are you really gonna go under the knife with the human? Really? So we're already at that state, and I think self-driving cars are not in some weird other bucket. We make this decision all the time, and we will quickly get to the right. place where people who are dr too drunk to drive, who are too sleepy to drive, um, are the ones who are killing us. We need right. to stop doing that. Uh, so if the present is self-driving cars, the future is self-driving autonomous flying cars. Your, your, your predecessor, Sebastian Thurn, has talked, uh, Thurn has talked about this uh, at length. Do you believe in our lifetimes we will have um, truly self-flying cars? Yes, we are certainly in our lifetime gonna have self-flying cars. Um, and by the way, they will be self-flying cars because especially once you get to the flying car status and many more people are using it, it would be irresponsible to let them fly. You're gonna have to let the, the, the thing fly itself. Whether it's cost effective and who it's cost effective for, I think is a more open question, but the technology roadmap is without question. When you think about the future, oh, how old are you right now? I'm 47. How old do you plan to live? Uh, gee, do I get to pick? That's awesome. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand if you think about the future, whether you are, you are one of the call many it, people. Call it 97. So, but, you, but Larry Page is working on all these projects to keep everyone alive forever. You think that's realistic? Uh, look, A, it might happen. B, I question whether working on the health of the body is the most pressing thing for us to do right now. Really? Well, because right now, the bulk of you in this room, certainly for me, the statistics say my mind will go before my body goes. And I don't know what would make me interested in having my body outlive my mind by decades, centuries. That sounds terrible. So let's spend all of our energy first making sure that mental health and mental well-being keeps pace with... with the physical side of things. Once they're tied, we can move them forward together, but I think it's premature given that the human body is already um, not the long pole in the tent to work more on that one. Uh, one of your colleagues, also a Googler, is Ray Kurzweil, who believes in the singularity. 
Do you believe in the singularity? Um, this idea the, that we're going to have that this the singularity we're download ourselves. The onto singularity chips. is a racy term meant to scare people, and so I choose not to use that term. The slightly more sanguine way of talking about that is when computers, which presumably will eventually happen, get to the place where they can make themselves better faster than people can make them better, it's hard to predict what will happen after that. Um, that still uh, sort of begs a kind of hysteria in the public that I don't think is warranted, and we are not on the cusp of doing that. Uh, computers are making good progress. There's a lot of boring tasks to automate, but I think panicking that computers are about to sort of take over is, uh, you know, sort of pulled from the Terminator, not from reality. You once worked on a paper, though, where yeah. you talked about the idea that you were worried about AI and what it could do. Um, I'm worried about people's reaction to AI. Um, my experience is that secrecy and fear and panic cause people to do really dumb things, individually and in groups. And if we choose to approach technology and science, which sadly a lot of this country does, from the perspective of fear and secrecy and panic, we are going to get bad outcomes. And that's not me being Pollyanna. I'm not saying that every technology is an absolute positive. Uh, no technology is an absolute positive. But I, essentially all technologies are a net positive in society, and it's incumbent upon all of us to work together as a society to get the most benefit possible from every technology and the least problems from it. And if we don't take that attitude, that's when problems come What's up. What's the scariest thing that we should, what should we be worried about when it comes to AI? Is there some, any, any piece of it? Yeah, it's public education. So here's how it plays out. Um, technology is going to continue to increase the quality of our lives and increase productivity in our lives, increase all kinds of social goods, and we should be having a huge party about that. But, it will remove jobs and open up new jobs. Every technology in history has done this. When those new jobs open up, the jobs will be open to people who can use robots and computers as a lever for their minds and a lever for their brains. And if we do not train the people of planet Earth, and for this country in particular, to use robots and computers as levers for their minds and their bodies, there will be open jobs, questions to ask, problems to solve, and they won't be able to help. That's the tragedy, and it will be caused by us having dropped the ball and helping them get ready for that. So if you were a student, um, and we may have some students in the audience today, and you could choose a major in college, what would it be? Learn how to learn. That's an easy one. Essentially everything. <laughs> Right. But, but if, if you're in kindergarten right now, most jobs don't even have a name yet for, that you'll have once you get into the workforce. If you're in college right now, it'll probably take you 10 or 15 years to get to the place where you don't even now know what business you'll be in, let alone what job you'll have, what specific place you'll be working. So there, there is no sense that you can just go to dental school and then you're gonna be safe for the rest of your life. Like those days are over and that's okay if we prepare our society for that. That is potentially a wonderful thing, but it could be a bad thing if we just stick our head in the sands and wish that it wasn't so. Can you find enough good engineers today? for your projects? No, I'm sorry, like you're triggering all my like personal rants here, but <laughs> I'm very worked up. So like people keep talking about the middle class and wishing that there was some job that you could have, that you could be trained at least at a basic level by the age of 18 to do, that you could not hire enough of them if you tried, that was open potentially to everybody in the world and paid a good middle class living, at least. I think that's programming. I, when you go around, like pick any five people here and three of them will tell you that their companies right now can't find enough programmers. Again, th we all know that this is the case, but we are not helping either the adults who need to get that help or the children 
who are going to need that help to be prepared for that future. So no, we can't find enough engineers. Let's solve that problem, that's a, like a big one. Um, I wanna to talk about something that may be a downer, but I think for you it's not, uh, which is failure. Yes. You like, fa you like failure. I love failure. Um, you were behind Google Glass. Yes. <laughs> Google Glass, dare I say, has been described as a failure. Uh, you don't have to be so gentle about it. <laughs> what happened? We don't have time for the whole thing, but look, failure is a really good thing when you embrace the reality that you don't know what you should be doing and you're gonna try things, run experiments, learn, and then pivot. That's failing, I didn't succeed, but that's great. Real failure is when you get to the point where you have the data, you know you should stop or you know you should pivot, and then you don't. That's failure. So Glass made one incredibly good choice and one incredibly bad choice, and they were snuggled up right next to each other. We made a learning platform for understanding how people would experience uh, the world if they didn't have to look down and sort of dive into the digital reality of their phones and then pop back up and be physically situated. If you could be physically and digitally situated at the same time, it would profoundly fix this schism that we all experience in our lives and someone, whether it's us or someone else, will eventually do that. That we started that as a learning program and we called it the Explorer program and we welcomed people to participate in exploring with us, that was perfect. Then, some people got excited and started talking about it as a product. I'm sure some of those people were internal, some of them were definitely external, and we started drinking too much of that Kool-Aid ourselves. We allowed ourselves to believe that this learning platform that we built was actually a finished product, when it absolutely was not. And that sent the expectations for this learning platform skyrocketing to the place where we couldn't live up to that, and we didn't find a way to retrench from that. And, by the way, the places where um, glass continues to be used in the world and get the most traction is actually doctors and warehouses, much more sort of um, people doing their work who actually need to solve this problem, not fashion models. So what's the lesson when you've gone now to look at other projects from this? Well, we don't do just consumer projects, so we can't draw sort of perfect lessons from this, but we could have iterated better, we could have started smaller, we could have started quieter, and I wish we had done all of those things. We should have spent more time in the enterprise space with doctors in warehouses saying, oh, you really want this? What are you doing? Wait, you can fix the airplane in half the time if you have glass? Well, tell me more about that. Well, how many more do you want? Like that kind of conversation would have led much more naturally, I think, to a success for glass than the path we went down. Okay, different question, sort of a philosophical question. Who should be paying for all of this innovation? And the reason I ask is, uh, you are in a very special place at a very special company uh, that has uh, found a way uh, to become one of the great toll booths of the world, and they've been able to use that cash to fund a lot of this research. Um, the government, as you know, uh, doesn't fund the research uh, the way it used to and is about to fund even less of it. Um, there is a venture capital model uh, over here. Shareholders, by the way, don't always love uh, companies investing uh, the way Google has and, and, given it, and giving companies the sort of uh, rope to do it. What's the right model? Uh, I hope we don't have to pick a single one First of all, it would be a disaster if the United States stopped funding basic research. I'm not sure how calibrated you are, but the best people in the world come here from all over the world because we will fund basic research better. And the dividends that those exceptional people pay to the country by coming here is unparalleled in what it does for our universities, in what it does for the sort of intellectual capital of this place. It's a national security emergency for us to not stop doing that. 
That's the NIH, that's NSF, that's DARPA. So, and those things, we at Alphabet and every other company that looks like it figured something out are standing on the shoulders of that work. The DARPA Grand Challenge, which itself was already decades after people had started trying to make autonomous vehicles, pushed the autonomous vehicle uh, efforts around the United States to the point w which gave us just enough confidence to start it at Alphabet. Um, venture capital isn't going away. I think it does make sense for some companies to take moonshots. In fact, I'm an evangelist for other companies besides Alphabet doing this. The world it has more than enough problems. You can't steal them all from me. If you take most of them, there'll still sadly be plenty left for X. So please, start your own moonshot factory. Take really big bets. Think long term and try to solve the world's problems. You know, it sounds too good to be true, but Alphabet has consistently, for 20 years now, said, let's find a big problem in the world, let's solve it, and we'll figure out how to get paid afterwards. If we're actually solving a problem, the money will come find us. And if we're not, we don't deserve to get paid. So I don't think that it's crazy to suggest that other people could do more of that too. Okay, final question I'm putting you on the spot. We are about to hear from a series of brilliant thinkers uh, with what are being called brave ideas. Uh, you don't know this, you're being put on the spot. You have to come up with a brave idea for this audience. What is the bravest idea you've been thinking about recently? So uh, the climate change stuff is on my mind. Um, I'm, I'm disturbed because it is one of the world's biggest problems. We can pretend that it's not, but it still is. Uh, sadly, uh, the CO2 and the temperature of our planet doesn't care about our arguments. Uh, we need to address that. And um, I am not discouraging people from setting up solar farms or working on wind turbines, as you pointed out we are. But there's an enormous amount that can be done to address climate change that doesn't look like climate change on the surface. And I would like to ask all of you to think really hard about how we can run at it more broadly. Let me give you two examples. There's um, something called Project Drawdown, which is a systematic attempt to say what would make the most difference if we worked on it. Number one, worldwide, would be better refrigeration. Number two would be onshore wind. This is at least according to them. Number three is reduce food waste. The CO2 emissions that come from producing the food are enormous. If we just wasted less food, it would make more difference than almost anything you could work on in terms of putting up more solar plants. Number six on that list, here's a big idea for you, is educate girls. How about that for an idea? And though I, I, I'm excited about Project Drawdown and COP21 and the things that people have uh, are pushing on, I don't think we're thinking broadly enough. If you look at that incredibly thoughtful list, nowhere on that list, literally nowhere on the list, does the word concrete show up. Concrete produces 5% of the world's CO2 emissions. That's like more than France, all of France, or more than England. It's crazy. And people just assume, like, oh, well, we got to have concrete. If on that list appeared we're gonna take down concrete. We're gonna find a way to get the benefits of concrete without the emissions of concrete. It would be enormous, not as good as educating girls probably, but worth doing. So I would encourage you all to think incredibly broad-mindedly about how we can use technologies and public policy in ways that don't smell on the surface like they're addressing climate change to address climate change. Astro Teller, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's now time for the trade idea. Hey there, Aspen. Hey there, Aspen. There we go. That's better. That's what I need to present my brave idea. And since I'm the new guy, they're making me go first. 
My name is Joshua Johnson. I am the host of 1A, which is a brand new talk show at Arizona on NPR from WAMU in Washington. Thank you. And my brave idea has to do with one of my favorite plays, West Side Story, right? That musical adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. In West Side Story, our Romeo, Tony, intervenes between a gang fight between two gangs who are literally ready to rumble with an all out, knock down, drag out, winner takes all fight. In the story, Tony convinces them to replace the rumble with a fair fight. The best two brawlers from each gang to duke it out. My job as the host of 1A is basically what Tony did in West Side Story. To convince people to stop rumbling and just fight fair. And if we don't do that, our democracy's in trouble. And I get it. A good rumble feels good. It feels good to see somebody take down those SOBs who you blame for all the problems in this country. And it's easier to do that if you bring a knife to the fist fight. That, of course, was what ruined Tony's plan. The gang leaders fell back on their old ways, pulled out their knives, and killed themselves. Democracy is a contact sport. Everyone gets bruises, even the winners. And the kind of bickering we see today is not only unproductive, it's cowardly. If you don't have the guts to focus on ideas and stop tearing down individuals, you belong in the stands, not on the field. I want more leaders. I want more leaders who are brave enough to focus on ideas and not ad hominem attacks. I want more leaders who are willing to say, I hate everything she stands for, but I do not hate her, and neither should you. And I want more Americans who are brave enough to demand these kinds of debates for the sake of our democracy. Just ideas against ideas, let them fight it out, and if you lose, come back with better ideas. Tony was right. A rumble can be clinched by a fair fight if you've got the guts to risk that. Are millions of Americans ready to start fighting fair for the sake of our democracy, for the sake of solving the common problems we all face? Could be. Who knows? Thanks for listening. Good afternoon. My name is Casey Harden. My business, revitalizing downtowns in Central America, leads me to invest in some of the most violent cities in the world. I'm passionate about my work. I dream about my work because I love cities. And in this interconnected world, in a world where the urban population is set to double by 2050, I think it's critical that we get even the complicated cities right. But we have to be careful. We'll cause as much harm as we do good if we don't do it inclusively. We'll, we'll displace exactly the people who need revitalization's benefits. So that word, inclusivity, to me, to a business person, seemed to mean something like opportunities for jobs and housing and education. That turned out to be only the half of it. I learned that in the context of chronically poor communities, opportunity is an upper rung on a long ladder. As a business looking to have a lasting impact, we had to start much lower and we had to be prepared to go much further. The ladder of co-prosperity that we're learning to climb with the communities where we work is the idea I wanted to share with you today. The first rung on that ladder for us was learning how to listen. Because to listen to someone, you have to get close. And when you get close, people can hear you as well. And that dialogue between the business sector and a community, if it's honest and sustained, not only builds trust, but makes it very clear to everyone involved exactly what kind of opportunity is required and what assets you have to work with. Standing on that rung of trust, even the most distressed communities we work with have been able to imagine a better future. And that was where the real magic started to happen for us. Shared visions may be humanity's most powerful force. They create a collective cognitive dissonance that both fuels and focuses collective action. They draw in people and they multiply the effects of opportunities. But we know that we can't stop at opportunity. What we've learned is that we have to take the next step to equity, creating past the ownership. Whether that's a home, a business, or simply a permanent seat at the table, the opportunity has to be connected with the path to equity to be truly sustainable. Thank you. I'm Yvonne Rolls-Hausen, and I'm a member of one of the most endangered professions today. I'm a fact checker. Luckily, 
I'm also the head of the checking department at The Atlantic, where facts do matter. While living in communist Eastern Europe, I saw how the press was controlled by an oppressive ideology and how people were starved for information. Yet today, with the web and 24-hour news, it can sometimes feel like we're almost drowning in information, making it difficult to assess its quality and its value. Too often, the media seeks to inflame rather than to inform. The more sensationalized, opinionated, or angrily partisan it is, the more popular it becomes. And we lazily choose to listen to information that confirms our own biases. Is it any wonder that we are so divided and unable to communicate civilly when we can't even agree on what is true? So I implore you to join me, because today we all need to be fact checkers. And most importantly, we need to teach our children proper analytical skills in finding and assessing information so that they can tell truth from fiction. Studies have shown that students often aren't able to distinguish news stories from ads and frequently trust biased sources on the web. Fact checkers constantly question accuracy and fairness of information. We swallow our own preconceived notions and go to multiple sources, seek varying perspective, and agonize over what's missing. We look at every angle to find that something wildly uncomfortable, often the very subtle truth. It takes time, care, and an open mind. But it isn't rocket science. These are common sense, teachable skills, yet we're failing to institutionalize them in education. Together, we must hold all sources accountable, expose fake news and alternative facts, which are simply euphemisms for lies. Instead, we must always demand accuracy, embrace rigorous standards, and teach our children to do the same. It is imperative to our democracy's growth, to our environmental survival, and to our humanity. We all have a moral responsibility to continually call out liars and their lies. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anita Allen, and I'm uh, Vice Provost for Faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, where I am also the Henry R. Silverman Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy. I also happen to be the recently elected Vice President and President-elect of the American Philosophical Association, Eastern Division. So, um, okay. Uh, the right to privacy has a foot in the grave. And maybe it belongs in the grave, right? Because it's a really old thing. It first debuted in the United States as a value in uh, privacy statutes 50 years ago. And then it premiered in human rights declarations, oh, 80 years ago. And 100 years ago, it found itself embodied and made explicit in our common law. And 250 years ago, it was enshrined in the Bill of Rights, like the Fourth Amendment. So it's really old, right? Maybe it should be in the grave. Privacy has a foot in the grave because we have put it there. We consumers we business leaders, we policymakers, by our voluntary choices and our negligent uh, indifference, we have allowed online shopping and search engines and profiling and uh, social media and big data collection, surveillance and the internet of things to overcome privacy. We've all done this and we paid the price. So my brave, idea is an optimistic prediction that not our children, because it's too soon, but our grandchildren will resurrect privacy from a shallow grave. And they will do it just in time to secure the freedom and the fairness and the democracy that we all value, the dignity that we value. In this future that I'm imagining, uh, the young people, then they'll be old, will be uh, longing for the solitude and the independence of mind and the confidentiality uh, that they don't have and they know existed in some time in the past. And in this future, this, this interest in privacy it might first emerge as a healthy fad, like um, avocado toast 
and, and tail. But it will become eventually a transformative mandate of our economy, of our market, of our morals, and of our political life. Privacy will become popular again, and unlike now, it'll be possible, because in my future, 2050, say, our brilliant data scientists and engineers will have learned how to, um, of course, they'll be properly resourced and incentivized, but they will have taught us how to secure cyber systems so that we'll have cyber resilience and cyber security that we need to undergird so many of the kinds of privacy that are important in digital societies. As an intellectual, I understand why many scholars critique privacy as an outmoded, even dangerous value, but they're overlooking something and they're sometimes somewhat partially valid critiques of privacy. Privacy is not old, it's not outmoded, it's a timeless, important human value. Thank you. Well, these have been great ideas, and I'm thrilled to be the last to present. I'm U.S. Senator Chris Coons, and, and I'm a Democrat, and I'm an optimist. You know, some folks are despairing about our ability to hear each other and to work together and to actually tackle the problems that face our country, and there's good reason for that. But I have an optimistic prediction that one of the unexpected outcomes of President Donald Trump's administration will be to make the Senate great again. Sometimes it's really not shared values or shared experience that brings us together, but it's an unexpected and shared opponent. And I'll give you a few quick examples. I've managed recently to successfully legislate with some of the most conservative Republican senators. Republican Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Corker, and I have come together to introduce a bold bill that will reform U.S. food aid in the face of entrenched interests that keep it inefficient and overly expensive. And Orrin Hatch, a senior, most senior Republican senator, and I work together to defend America's manufacturers and innovators from the theft of their trade secrets. We wrote, introduced, and President Obama signed into law the Defend Trade Secrets Act. But the root of how we found each other and how we helped work to restore some of the checks and balances that are so essential to our society really might surprise you. Because it comes from what I view as the best hour every week in the Senate. And it's not the hour that we all head home. It's Wednesday morning, first thing. And to make it there, I have to get on the train at 625 from Wilmington, Delaware. And every time I say, oh, why am I going to this one more time? I am surprised and thrilled at what I hear, because that's the hour of the Senate prayer breakfast. It's when two dozen senators, conservative and evangelical, Mormon and Protestant, Jewish and even Buddhist, gather together for an hour, and we do two things that don't exist in the rest of our weeks. We trust each other, and we listen. One senator every week stands up and shares from his or her life and experience and background and challenges the rest of us to understand them as people and to hear them. Their suffering, their struggle, their purpose, their path, their values. And out of that experience has come the greatest opportunities for bipartisanship and progress that I've had in seven years. Let me briefly share as a progressive Christian and Democrat that I think both parties, and mine in particular, need to realize that progressive values aren't just secular values. You can get to some of our most important priorities through two routes. You care about welcoming immigrants and refugees. You can get there because you care about other people as an intellectual, as a humanist, as a principled matter. Or you can get there relying on passages in Torah and Gospel about welcoming the stranger. You care about creating a new environment where we fight climate change. You can believe that because you have a scientific foundation and you see the imperative for federally funded research and development for clean energy so our children and grandchildren can have a more positive environmental future. Or you can say, as I would, that God created the earth and gave us stewardship over it. And you can partner with your evangelical brethren and commit yourself to improving our world rather than flooding our oceans with plastic garbage and pumping pollutants into the air. The party that recognizes that the vast majority of Americans are people of faith 
is the party that will be able to propose solutions that address their big challenges and that hear them. And my party is one that needs to see that we can solve the real problems of our country by trusting each other, by listening to each other, and by allowing for both pathways to get us to the promised land. At the end of the day, we have to make clear that we fight for things like civil rights and social justice and the environment, not in spite of our faith, but in many cases as Democrats, because of it. And those of us who come at these principles from a secular perspective have to recognize that we can make common cause in a way that respects the best in America and allows us to once again be the republic that is the hope of the world. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I know you're hot. I know you're thirsty. We have palm tea right out there. Thank you, Stuart and Linda. We have water. But bear with me just for a few minutes, because I have to do some housekeeping. And I know no one loves it, but we all need it. Um, here we go. Passes. All times on this campus, you have to wear your pass. If you don't have it, we have to send you back to registration or back to your hotel. I'm so sorry, but we have security issues. You got to wear it. This pass should get you into everything you want to go to. We don't have sign-up tickets. However, tomorrow morning at the Maroon Bells, we have a photograph. We've done some really fantastic talks this week. There's one. And there is a sign-up, and you can do that at the reception tonight. Some thanks are in order. First, David Bradley, all of you at The Atlantic, Jeff Goldberg, Bob Cohn, thank you. We wouldn't be able to do this without the Atlantic. <laughs> to all of the sponsors who are too numerous to list tonight, thank you. Because without your support and without your speakers today and without your help in making this a great festival, we also couldn't do it. To our wonderful team at the Aspen Meadows, thank you. Because they are our real partners in producing the, the logistics and the conference capability. A real heartfelt thank you to our patrons who are wearing yellow tags, yellow lanyards, who have made it possible for us to bring over 300 scholars to the festival this year, along with the Arthur Viding Foundation and the Bush Foundation. <laughs> They've made it possible in part to bring our talented youth poets from the Creative Young Leaders Alliance, joining us from across the US. And they will jam tomorrow with Lil Buck and other artists. Congratulations to them. And for those of us that have been doing this for a while, we owe a great debt of thanks to Jackie and Mike Bezos for bringing us again the Aspen Bezos Scholars. Are those kids here? These young people from high schools across America and from Africa will ask the best questions in the room, I guarantee it. There's a slide I want to have go up. A few months ago, we all lost a friend. Whether you watched her nightly on NewsHour or met her here at Ideas Festival, Gwen Eiffel entered our lives as a determined, dedicated, and oh-so-smart voice about the day's events and about the news and the questions that touch us all. One of the things that Gwen loved to do was to talk to young people, especially young journalists. Even this past September, amidst her cancer treatments, she addressed students at Colorado College, saying, I believe if we are only talking to people who agree with us, we are failing in some way to understand our world and our country. We have to make sure that everything we're finding out isn't just what happened around the corner, what happened with our only friends, what happened with only the politicians or radio hosts we like to listen to. Otherwise, we stay stuck in the middle. Gwen urged young journalists to be tough, to get the story, to get the facts, to do right by their profession, and to dig deep for the truth. It's in her honor, thanks to her best friend, Michelle Norris, 
and Gwen's beloved brother, Earl Eiffel, that we've created the Gwen Eiffel Journalism Scholars Opportunity, thanks to our patrons, our first effort in recognizing Gwen's contribution to her field by inviting six young journalists to join us across the week to attend and cover sessions throughout the festival. And for the first half of the festival, may I ask three of them to stand? Dina Takuri from AJ or Al Jazeera Plus. Daniel Halper. I hope you're here. Daniel Harper, Harper from the Weekly Standard and Eugene Scott from CNN Politics. You have big shoes to fill in your career. We implore you to fill them. And thanks to you again to our patrons who have made it possible for these kinds of scholarship opportunities to exist. Okay, on a little bit to the festival and I promise I'll get you out of here. Our sessions across the week will inspire us. Take the fascinating possibilities that genetic science presents or the ways creative genius sparks us all. How the internet can be a force for good how amazing young entrepreneurs are making things in America. Just like the bag that each of you have that took us a long time to figure out where we would get it. An idea of sisters Emily and Betsy, daughters in a military family who put vets to work and makes all of these items repurposing military surplus material, not abroad, but at home, right here. Not to mention, The stories of Casper Mattresses, American Giant, Maker's Row, and Love Your Melon, the founder of which is here and gave us all a hat in our bag. Uh, this next generation of leaders driving the American economy are actually here to share how they're creating jobs and opportunity and real cool, really cool products. It's so, so exciting to see what our younger generations are up to, be they poets or makers, NGO leaders or political aspirants, academics or journalists, or writers or doctors. Many are here ready to share their big ideas and dreams. Over the next several days, we will also challenge ourselves. We need to challenge ourselves. We need to think about the kind of society, the kind of America we want. We need to think about the kind of issues that we face as our economy changes and is disrupted, about the kind of internet that is fashioning our social lives, our consumptive behavior, and quite frankly, the civility we bring to our conversations with one another. We need to understand and appreciate the language of science, not only the amazing things science is doing for humanity, but also the ethical dilemmas that we face in its application or not. We need to understand the differences between the America that each of us knows and the America that so many others experience. This is why we are bringing you the kinds of presenters and topics and questions we will raise this week to challenge ourselves, to think, to imagine how we can each participate more actively in the world we want to build a better society. So in opening the Ideas Festival, a couple of thoughts. I always suggest that pass holders take advantage of the experts here to learn about ideas and subjects that might not be so familiar. Do go to subjects you know nothing about. But more perhaps this year, talk to people you have never met. Has there ever been a time when conversation across the aisles, color or gender lines, age and economic and geographic demarcations ever been so important? To help you along, we've doubled down on opportunities to meet one another and discuss thoughts and ideas. Our roundtable series at lunches, where questions raised can be addressed at tables in an intimate setting. Our creative tension series, thanks to our wonderful friends at IDEO, who will challenge you to think across issues layer by layer in an interactive way. To Harvard Business School's David Moss, whose provocative and interactive case study will take you back to the Federalist Papers and really imagine what they meant to professors Willer and Feinberg, who will coach us on how to listen to those whose values might be different from our own, and then how to be effective communicators when we live in such a politically polarized world. 
And if you need a glass of wine, like I do right now, um, <laughs> to loosen up that spirit of conversation, participate in our wine and signs each afternoon where you can meet with each other, our amazing presenters and authors, and just converse. Last evening, in one of Spotlight's Health's most memorable moments, Walter Isaacson and musician and artist John Baptiste had this magical, magical discussion about the power of music and art to heal and how art can make change in our lives. I thought it would be fun to share a snippet. When you think about creativity, and you think about, you know, like I was saying about liberation and the idea of playing an instrument and figuring out a way to express yourself in your full being and whatever you do, I think that, that you find that when you look at everything in your environment and you say, well, they're playing this way, they're playing that way. Why are they not playing together in these ways? And you know, I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn about our, our world. And if you look at politics, if you look at relationships, you know, it's kind of like sometimes things don't work together, but sometimes they do, and nobody's tried it yet. Yeah. This week, let's try it. On behalf, on behalf of the amazing, amazing team that I have, and believe me, we have an incredible team of people that have put this together, welcome to Aspen Ideas Festival 2017.